Um, whatever his name was or is or however you had the misfortune to come across anything that he's ever done uh, on video or whatever, if you saw this thing in person. But this dumb fuck they found in South Texas, we told the story before, he's like 7'6 and 450 pounds, a big fucking stomach and no athletic ability and dumber than a box of rocks, stupider than owl shit slapped with a board, as my Aunt Lola used to say. And it, it, he was sitting next to me, and at, a, at some point in this fucked up, over-gimmicked, convoluted match, he's supposed to stand up and slap Bobby's leg, which is going to distract him, and they do a double pin, but the Fantastics come up with the count first, and they win the belts. Well, this dumb fuck, even with me, trying to, with elbowing him, actually hitting him, gigging him, go, now, do it, do it now. He stands there like a fucking stick. Until finally he did it late, and, and basically the double pin ended up with the Midnight Express winning the belts right in front of everybody, and then the referees giving the Fantastics the belts. And then, because they wanted the big spot with the Giant, my pre-gimmick tennis racket was gimmicked so he could break it, because he was so weak, and he couldn't draw a greasy string out of a cat's ass, much less break a tennis racket in his bare hands. They gimmicked it. But they insisted I hit him with it first, and he no sell it, and then him break it. And when I hit him with it, it just it just toppled over. The old head came off the racket, <laughs> just a fart. And you can see me going down the aisle how fucking hot I was, right? So instead of going out and stealing a show in front of twenty five thousand people in Texas Stadium, the match was good for what it was, but it, the finish just sucked, and it didn't get across what we were trying to do, and. Then we get the payoff on a quarter of a million dollar house where we're in a tag team title match. Guess what we got paid? Four hundred each. Well, no, eleven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, well there you go. Which no, no, there you go. That's when we started saying, "What the fuck are we doing here?" And that's what we. <laughs> you also managed the second time on that show because the ten man tag, ten man two teams, you managed Rip Oliver. Uh, uh, well, yeah, well, and no, and, and Rip Oliver was against Mike Von Erich in a single match also, and beat him too. So yeah, we, we got to sh all the heels got the shit kicked out of us. I got eleven hundred fifty bucks, but the point is, that fucking sucked. And uh, we started, uh, we didn't get the check till the following week, and then wheels were in motion. In six weeks, we'd be in Charlotte. But anyway, uh, on Monday, the day after the Texas Stadium show in Irving, Texas, fifteen miles from Dallas, guess where we are? We're back in Fort Worth. <laughs> this time, not even at Will Rogers Coliseum at the Exhibition Hall. Rip Oliver and Johnny Mantell, three falls on TV for 120 bucks. Uh, then we go to uh, Cayuga, Texas, uh, which is about 90 miles away, against the Fantastics and the Captain's Match for $100. We are off on Wednesday, May the 8th. And once again, this is he like hour and a half, two hour trips, if that, every day, or being in town, Fort Worth and Dallas and off on Wednesday, we're resting our bodies. We made $810 this next week, right? And so we're resting our bodies and there was something to be said for that, but that's when we started uh, reestablishing our relationship with Jimmy Crockett. So Thursday, May 9th, we go to Broken Bow, Oklahoma, which is 200 miles away, so a 400 mile round trip. You'd probably leave about two in the afternoon. You'd get back about two in the morning. Um, Against the Fantastics and a captain's match uh, for 225 bucks. Then we're back in Dallas at the Sportatorium, where Bobby has a singles match with Sean Casey and get $100, which fucking sucked in Dallas. But the next day, we're in River Oaks, Texas, 20 minutes, 20 miles from my apartment. And Dennis goes, Bobby and, and Tommy Rogers are at the other spot show. That's another thing. When they ran two towns, they'd split the boys up and send two of them to each town. It's ludicrous. So I managed Dennis Condry in a 20-minute Broadway with Bobby Fulton 20 minutes from the apartment for 115 bucks. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. <clears throat> However, the reason why I wanted to go to Sunday, May 12th, this was an historic day. Mother's Day, for one thing. Uh, but also our first day in St. Louis, Missouri, at the Keel Auditorium. We were so looking forward to this because we are booked at the Keel Auditorium in historic St. Louis against the Fantastics. Off the Dallas TV, we're going to have a great match in the home of the NWA, right? This is going to be a thrill. I got goosebumps thinking about it right now. They're flying us up there. Uh, of course, they sent us a coach ticket, and I see that we upgraded here because with our frequent flyer gimmick. But anyway, um, 
Oh, so we go up there, and unfortunately, what I neglected to uh, consider in my excitement over going to St. Louis was that Sam Mushnick had now been retired for three and a half years. We get there, and the house in the Keel Auditorium is $15,000. And that translates not even 1,500 people, I don't think, at that point in time. And we had the match. But it, it, and we, it, it was the Keel Auditorium, for heaven's sake. So that was a thrill. But <laughs> the, the, the St. Louis and Kansas City, the Central States office, had asked for us up there off the Dallas TV. So that was not for world class. That was a Central States booking. So our check came separately. It came about a week and a half later. And when we got it, that wasn't the first time we, our mouths had dropped open when we saw how few people were in the Keel Auditorium. And then our mouths dropped open when we saw how few numbers were on the check from Heart of America Sports Promotions. $150. No. $150. Bucks. We, we flew from Dallas to St. Louis. We spent 46 bucks on a motel, right? We, we ate, which cost by, uh, twice at fucking Wendy's. That's what we were all doing in those days, 20 bucks. And we upgraded to first class, 60 bucks each way, because we were hot shit making our St. Louis debuts, right? <laughs> so we went in the goddamn hole for that one. <laughs> and that's why... The next time they asked for us, we had already given our notice in Dallas, right? And we were already leaving to go to Charlotte, and, and they had booked us to go back to St. Louis and to Kansas City. And we said, no, we're, we're only going to do it uh, if we if we get a guarantee. we got to have $200 a guy or whatever it was, right, for the two shots. And that's when we got there and found out that we were in a tag team tournament. And we worked four times that night for the $200 guarantee. But I digress. Anyway, so that was our debut in, in St. Louis. And then just so you know, the, actually the next week is, is interesting. We come back on Monday and, of course, uh, go back to Fort Worth for that the weekly boar fest where we worked with Scott Casey and the great Kabuki, where I tried to steal my jacket, but he got it, Sunshine got it back for $125. Then we worked on Tuesday in Atlanta, Texas. But listen to this one. 180 miles away from Dallas. In Atlanta, Texas. At a high, local high school gym. They do a $15,000 house. And because there was only eight of us on the card and we did the old captain's match deal, we got $325 a piece. So in Atlanta, Texas on a $15,000 house at a spot show, we got Better than 25% of our payoff on a quarter of a million dollar house at Texas Stadium. We were off on Wednesday, May 15th. We went to Prosper, Texas on Thursday, May 16th. Uh, it was a 100-mile round trip from Dallas for $115. We were back in Dallas on Friday night doing it because Dallas at the Sportatorium every two weeks was a house show. But every two weeks was the world-class syndicated show that everybody has seen that the great close-up camera work and the hot crowd. Well, we were on an underneath match beating Mike Bond and Skip Young. You got 115 bucks, and that's all we did that night. And we get up the next day, and, and, and this was a very, very special day, Saturday, May 18th, the first day that I met in person Sam Miniker. Oh, wow. Get out of here. We go to Fort Bliss, Texas, for an afternoon show at 2 o'clock, which is right next to El Paso. And is a little armory, and, and Sam Miniker came in to say hello to everybody. We did $10,000 there at the armory, because he was living out there. We did $10,000 there at the, at the little afternoon show and got 200 bucks for that, and then went to El Paso, the Civic Center that night, where we did $22,000 and did $275 in our match with the Fantastics. Um, I was handcuffed to Kerry Von Erich. Uh, we almost had a riot that night, as I recall, <laughs> getting to the ring. Uh, and that's why when I was handcuffed to Kerry Von Eric, I was actually the happiest fucker in the place because I figured they wouldn't shoot at me just in case they might hit him. Uh, so that, that day was actually somewhat profitable and eventful. And then the next day we went back to Dallas and we were off. But that's, that was the thing with, with world-class wrestling and, and, and really, they, when they ran more spot shows up around the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, even though they were dinky towns, it was better than when they were running South Texas. There was a $100 minimum in South Texas, 
but it was 500 miles each way, and that's all you were going to get was $100 because the towns were drawn. So it would cost you more, as I just illustrated, to fly and and be able to actually get there and back than than you made. So it was, but at the same time, you could be in Texas Stadium in front of 25,000 people, then of course not get paid properly, or you could go to a high school gym 90 miles from your house and make the equivalent of what would be 900 or 1,000 dollars today. So it it just there was no rhyme or reason. But that's when we saw all of those things going on. That's when we we oh and and when the when the talent deal went south, uh, as I mentioned, as you notice, we were not in any mid south towns uh, during that that period that I mentioned. But for example, earlier in the year, um, we had been, already been brought back to New Orleans. We'd already been brought back to Oak City and Tulsa, where, as I mentioned, you know, we we made more than we made in the Dallas territory the rest of the. So the goddamn time, um, it, 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 Watts brought us back for one just four day period in February, where we made uh, seven, seven, where we made seven, actually three days. We made seven hundred and seventy bucks in three days, but in Dallas, uh, the the week be, or the day before we left, we made eighty bucks, and when we got back, we made one hundred and fifty. So we were making better payoffs in the in the territory that we were being booked out to than the one we were supposed to be working in. It was, it was, it was brutal. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this, Jim, because obviously you didn't have a great experience in Dallas. You didn't get rich in Dallas and Kevin Mantel was the booker and you never got to work with the Von Erichs, sadly, because I'm pretty sure Kevin and Kerry would have loved having Bobby Eaton fly around the ring for them. But all things being equal, everything considered, in any way do you think, hi, Harley Quinn, is in any way do you think that it ended up being to your benefit that you didn't start in January of 85 before the rock and roll even got there and that you started when you did? Well, yes, for, for several reasons. One, that everybody had rested their bodies, you know, with that schedule where we were only working five days a week sometimes. And, and you know, with the shorter trips, we got more rest and mentally. And also I got some more promo practice because going and doing the, the really brief or, or tightly controlled ones in Mid-South for te a television show that really was controlled on all levels was great. But being able to go out and just having the time and not giving a shit to extrapolate on the Dallas, on the Fort Worth TV uh, and getting a lot of that practice in where, it was, you know, I was scorching everybody. That, that was that was really helpful to do in TBS TV later on. So... And well, no, it really was. Cause, no, and then, yeah, I was thinking, I, I guess Mark Lorenz in many ways was like your batting tee before you got to the major leagues of David Cross yeah. and Tony Schiavone did it. And, and then also, it because World Class wasn't actually syndicated, we got on TV and we were seen because the people that, that saw us on TBS in Atlanta, we would have come from nowhere if we'd have just come directly from Mid-South. Because while... Mid-South Wrestling was huge for the TV markets who did not get Mid-South Wrestling. They didn't know what the fuck was going on there, so they wouldn't have known us. But because we had been in world class already, and at least we'd been working with the Fantastic for six months every night. So at least we were having great matches. We were just not getting anywhere with it. Um, so they had seen us have a bunch of great matches on TV, so that helped. And then when we showed up on TBS, you know, they already kind of thought we were somebody. So all yes, it, it was it was a help. It just holy mackerel. It could have been a little, <laughs> a little bit better all the way around. I just I, I they just moved so the booking moved so slowly. It involved so few people, and you saw the same people. It, it, it was a weekly territory like Memphis, but it moved so much more slowly than Memphis. I think that's what the problem was. Other than Vince. Did every small office that all of a sudden hit gold stay small? Um, yeah, oh, yeah. That's Well, that's another thing. When they were, you know, all of a sudden, not only are they running Texas Stadium, but they're the biggest television program in Israel. And they're, you know, they're starting to run the, the, that Manning Bowl in, in the, the suburb of Boston that did, you know, eight or 10,000 people at time. Um but they're still running out of the goddamn, you know, sportatorium where when Ken Mantel and Bronco Lubitsch come in in the morning, they flip the lights on. They got 22 pistols to see if they can pick off some of the rats when they're running back out of the, the light. You know, it was that's they they were still a little bitty company. Almost 
until everybody started chasing Vince, uh, when, you know, Crockett got an office in Dallas and when Watts moved his office over to, to Dallas, Dallas is a death of everybody. <laughs> everybody, everybody always stayed where they were because they were smart enough. No, it, it's, it's been great before, but it'll, it'll also be, it'll also be, you know, bad again. So yeah, <laughs> Except Nick Goulas, the story goes, when he built a couple of years before he finally, I think he was doing it just to show people that he was still all right after Jarrett split off with him. Like, this was two years before he ended up selling everything to Jerry. Um, they say he built a new office building in Nashville. And the story I got was that he paid $180,000 in cash for it. Not in cash like, I'll write you a check and go cash it in cash like, here's what I had in this office safe. Because as we mentioned, even back in those days, the the spot shows were cash uh, cows. But anyway, and also uh, some of the big shows were cash cows too. If they drew two hundred fifty something thousand dollars, just gave me and the Midnight Express a little over thirty three hundred bucks of it. By God, uh, yeah, that's what we got back on the phone <laughs> with with i did with with uh jimmy crockett and dusty and like well is there still an opening we feel that we have fulfilled our personal obligation to the cowboy by serving our penance here especially since he's no longer being allowed to book us now out into, into his territory so instead we're going to kansas city where bob goggle is treating us to fucking bankruptcy on a goddamn budget so that's that's when we uh, opened those lines of communication up and got and we started at the end of June. Bobby Eaton was always so quiet on camera, obviously, but when you guys get these checks and you're commiserating amongst yourselves, I would picture Dennis being vocal. Did Bobby speak up? Did Bobby usually have something to say? Um, generally, a lot of nodding and agreeing, and I did not write corny. <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't actively going to whip me by his ass over it, but he certainly wasn't turning any cartwheels either. I'd seen him happy when he got checks and I don't think I ever saw him really happy. I mean, a couple of times astonished even when we got some of our first last stampede checks, but I never saw him either happy or astonished at any of the checks we got in, in Dallas. So, but yeah, D Dennis, especially the first time that he did a captain's match. And and they they actually paid him because the the guy that did the caps match was supposed to get something extra, right? And the minimum was fifty dollars on any show. They were gonna pay you less than fifty dollars on any show anywhere. One night with the spot show, it was the shits. He did the captain's match. He got his check sixty three dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and he was indignant. It was just like they they just they just figured it right down to the nub they gave him just as much as they could see not even 62 but 63 dollars they're just like he said if they need the fucking 13 dollars a goddamn bad they should have kept it <laughs> so so that was it, it was just it was not a uh it was not a lucrative uh, part but it did it did serve its purpose yes all right but it's you get a 63 dollar payoff for working twice in dallas in 1985 now we know that oh my god well anyway but that's what it was like so for people who have wondered and i all both of you out there who have wondered what it would be like traveling on the road uh, in world-class wrestling back in the day that's it it was a, it was feast or famine good and bad Fun and not fun, close and far. It was, it was, it was contradictions, Brian. A paradoxical situation. You either worked with the Von Erics or you didn't. You either worked with the Von Erics or, by God, you didn't. I think we touched them about four times, actually. I had two two tag matches with Mike on the other side. That one I mentioned with Kevin, and something else I think where we passed in the night. Anyway. <laughs>